So welcome everybody to the next series in the story of Rama. And I think we're now on the fourth part. So we'll begin with anyway a standard prayer. You can join in, by now you know it. That is uh, for teacher and student. Om Sahana Vautu Sahana Obunuktu Saha viryam karavahai Tejasvinavaditam astuma vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both and our learning. May we study together with great energy. May we become illumined from our studies. May we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Om Sri Rama Rama Rami Ti Rami Raj, <coughs> Rajmi Mano Rami Om Sri Rama Rama Rami Ti Rami Rami Mano Rami Sahasranama Tatulyam Ramanama Varanani. I delight in the beautiful name of Sri Ram again and again. For even once this name is remembered, then the name of Sri Rama bestows a fruit equal to the thousand names of that one that pervades the whole universe. So, uh, Last week, we finished with a kind of a drama being played. We described the background to it. That is the character of Vishwamitra, and described at great length all the great tapasya that he had to overcome, or had to use in order to overcome some key difficulties that we all have. Jealousy, anger, pride, all of these things. And these also required to push from us. Unfortunately, we translate this word as something like austerity. And we can think maybe of uh, people doing harsh self-damage to themselves. That's not what we mean. We mean changing the course of our habit, taking the unconscious area of the mind and reforming it in a more positive, beneficial direction. So Vishwamitra had to spend many, many years, and at each point, there was some kind of thing that dragged his mind down again, he had to start again. And at the beginning, his idea was power, and, and uh, that is also our idea sometimes in human life and social life, that the motive behind all our actions would be power, on the one side, and greed. Power, greed, and lust. That is uh, an insatiable desire to satisfy ourselves, a characteristic of egoism, an egocentric position. So Vishwamitra, the story of Vishwamitra, tells us a very valuable lesson. It shows that we require persistence, determination, and we might start off with uh, an, not such an admirable motive. But as we gain more and more in our wisdom and knowledge, we understand that power that is handled by the right person, a person of wisdom, is for the benefit of society, not against them. Vishwamitra learned this lesson, and he was also able, of course, with such great power as a Brahmarishi, the highest you could possibly be, because you now have control, as it were, of cosmic mind. You sit where cosmic mind sits. You sit on the royal throne of divinity. And just as Brahma, the cosmic mind, can dispense everything that we want and does so, every thought movement has its effect like that. When you do it in a controlled way, 
with truth at the center, your words, your thoughts, instantaneously become materialized. Now, people who are ordinary people, not at that status, will be a little afraid. Because if somebody, whatever comes out of that great Rishi's mouth will come true, Theoretically, if he says, may horns grow on your head, that will happen. And if he says, may you be blessed, that will happen. So you can imagine a scene that requires three components. Firstly, Dasarata and the king's court. Dasarata isn't just, uh, doesn't just come on the scene. If you can chase his lineage, his family back, it goes to a very distinguished line, the solar dynasty. It goes back to Ishvaku, the son of Manu. And this tells us that if we are to advance in our life, we can consider that genetically, we are the product of hundreds and thousands and millions of ancestors on both sides, X and Y chromosomes coming together to fulfill all their aspirations in our life. It's a very noble way of looking at things. It gives us a certain inspirational motive to fulfill our obligations to all our ancestors. And we are all born in a unique situation, all as a result of this lineage. And another way of saying that is our karma. That is all our thoughts, all our actions drives us forward and provides us with a geographic location, a scene, if you will, in a cosmic play, a certain historical era, born to certain uh, family members with brothers, sisters, in a social environment that is assisting us. Although it is created by our thinking, whether it's good or bad, the fruits of it come now. What we are today is a result of whatever happened in the past. The present moment ultimately becomes the past very quickly. You know, when I said quickly, it's already in the past. So the next component really that we have to insert, having acknowledged the historical merit or otherwise of our actions and being thankful for the situation that we are now, in a sense of abundance or a state of abundance and well-being. The next thing really will be, this merit leads us toward a goal of freedom and brings in resources. Dasarata had this wonderful resource. Vishishta was the guru, the teacher, such an enlightened sage, himself a Brahmarishi. An enlightened sage was the guru of the king's court that provided the king with some wisdom, some direction, so that all the decisions that were made were made for the overall good. And in those days, and even today, this should be our ideal, that those who have the capacity to wield power should consider the welfare of all beings. And the central theme of the story of Rama will be this theme of dharma. We can translate it in different ways, but in the sense I'm talking about it, it means the right thing to do. It implies qualities such as justice, it implies bringing, restoring a harmony and balance to your environment and to society. Environment meaning literally the ecological environment that we are in, the social environment that we're in, and in, it uh, involves all the aspects of the administration that we find today, education, housing, uh, welfare of the citizens, citizen vice bureau, if you will, all of these things have not really changed from ancient days because the requirements, the needs remain the same. Now, Shankaracharya and his Viveka Shudamani will tell us, we are so fortunate to have a human birth. This is another way of saying, we are born in a certain line. In this case, Dasara was born in the line of Ikshaku, the most distinguished line that you can have if you are a military person or an administrative saint. So this distinguished line you're carrying forward in a unique role for the good, for the noble good of 
the society that you represent. Even more fortunate if you come across the truth contained in the Vedas, even more fortunate are you if you have a competent teacher. And all of this so far applies to Dasaratha, King Dasaratha. One more extra component comes in, the whole embodiment of self-control, self-discipline, tapas, perseverance, purity. These represented in the form, in the personality of Vishwamitra. What a wonderful drama is presented. So we can imagine the king's court now, and Vishwamitra is presenting himself, maybe feigning a little anger, as was his unconscious wound, but now completely in control of it, of course. You can imagine him tapping his foot, feigning impatience, and he wasn't in a hurry to move. And of course, when he arrives, all the guards knew who he was. He was well known, very distinguished, upright, physically upright person of, don't forget, a former military man himself. And so the, the people receiving him at the door or the gate, as it were, they pay quick homage to him and they go and run, run into the, uh, the court of King Dasarata and inform him of his visitor, this legend on earth, not only on earth, but in the Devaloka, in all the regions of all beings. And Vishwamitra has, of course, once been uh, himself a Kshatriya king, unequaled now, as we told the story last week, in his tapasya and self-discipline. Standing there as a Brahmarishi must have looked extremely impressive, and Dasarata immediately comes out of his palace to welcome this great one. And the stranger, who you can imagine with a tangled hair, jatta, and uh, burning eyes, seemed pleased. So far, so good. And after laying a long uh, palm on Dasarata's head in blessing, he goes into the palace with the king, uh, into the cour a courtyard, and all are just agog at his arrival. And the visitor doesn't speak. You can just imagine the scene, dignified. He only looks around him with regard uh, one, uh, of one who has seen many, many palaces in his lifetime. Not impressed one way or the other, person of even-mindedness. And even when he is seated, Vishwamitra, friend of the universe, kept silent because the characteristic of Rishi is also Muni, a silent one. And he sits there as if to remind Dasrata of his duty as a host. And one of the duties is to praise the guest. Now, if this is unwarranted flattery, just diplomacy, it's not going to really work. And so there's a genuine appreciation that comes from the king. And the king says in a clear voice, something like this, Vishwamitra, your coming here is a very fortunate godsend to me. It's like nectar to a mortal and rain to the famine. The birth of the son of a son to the children, like a treasure to a poor man. This flowery kind of courtly language is being used. Like the morning sun, you dispel the darkness of the night. Your face brings joy to my sight. All of these things, he says. My heart is full. And then he recounts his history. As if the visitor doesn't know it, of course. Born a king, you have, but it's for the benefit of everybody assembled. Saying this is the uh, CV, if you like. This is the biography of this distinguished person that you see you were born a king you have become through your tapas you have become a brahma rishi and uh, you have uh, distinguished us now with your visit you have um, engaged in all these uh, ideals of purity and patience persistence and so on and so forth and now you have great power and I have to respect that. And if you command anything, then I shall have to obey you. 
And of course, Vishwamitra is delighted at this. So he rejoiced to hear these words of the Sarata. And of course, his face brightens and he says, O oh, king, your words are worthy of you. Because you are born, he also gives a reciprocal biography. You are born in the Ikshwalku line with Vashishta for your guru. These are the fortunate things that have been assembled for you. This is how you have taken advantage of the resources in your life and many other lives before. O king, your words are worthy of you, born in this line with Vashishta as a great distinguished guru. What else could you say? You have said yes. Before I have asked, yeah, I'll give you anything, whatever you want, I can give you. So I'm so happy. I'm about to ask you something. You already said yes. And you saying yes fills my heart with joy. And straight away he explains the purpose of his visit. What is the purpose of his visit? He was currently performing a sacrifice. What is the duty he has now as a Brahman, Brahma Rishi with Brahman Jnani? His duty is not to remain in a state of absorption, state of samadhi, any of these things. No, his duty is now to use that for the benefit and welfare of all beings. But he can't do it in a violent way because he's not an administrative saint anymore. The great King Janaka was an administrative saint. Rama is an administrative deity. Somebody who is born of the royal line, somebody who is entitled to shoot weapons and defend those who are weak. But that's all been renounced by Vishwamitra. He's now dedicated to this wonderful mechanism of yajna or yaga, fire sacrifice. Now, in these ancient days, the fire sacrifice had four meritorious components. Firstly, the offerings that are put into the sacred fire represent the material prosperity for a country. They are there for the welfare of all beings. All citizens require rainfall. Rainfall only comes, and good climate only comes, conducive conditions for food growing. If there is rainfall, and that rainfall and the right conditions only occurs when there are dedicated people who propitiate all the natural forces around for the good of the welfare of all beings. May all beings be abundant. And so all the material offerings that are put into the fire are all representations of this abundance. That's the first component. A wonderful generosity of spirit that says, I'm doing this not for my own benefit. Indeed, every offering that you put into the fire you follow with the swaha, that is, may things be auspicious, and then it's followed by, not for my benefit, but for benefit of everybody. And with every offering, that is done. And then the second component was, it is a social system. It was in, uh, a, an opportunity for community involvement reciprocating the understanding it is for the good of the whole of society is a cohesive thing that brings people together and thirdly it teach people it teaches people and inculcates wisdom and culture their involvement in it for a higher good so the whole thing is around generosity and selflessness and the fourth thing every set fire sacrifice was for a specific cause we are doing this to get the to get that for example king dasaratha's own yajna that produced four sons that was the objective may i have four sons it's not a selfish thing it is for the good of the whole of society and everybody benefits all inclusively of course every father is delighted to have children Every father is delighted to have the ongoing legacy. But behind it, of course, is the whole of society is going to benefit from this. I remember the controversy, well, not remember, I wasn't around at that period of time. But in England, this huge controversy when King Edward abdicated, 
because he said, I have to weigh up. You know, you're asking me to abandon the woman I love. But you see, in the light of this kind of dharma, he should have given that up because a higher duty is there, in many people's opinion. In the light of this kind of dharma, it is for the good of all others. And we have to carry this theme with us throughout the whole of the story of Rama, if we are to understand this properly. And so anyway, what's stopping you from performing this great sacrifice of six days duration? Well, there's only one difficulty, and that is there are obstacles in the form of demons. These demons are Maricha and Subahu is what they were called. They were the sons of another, of a demoness, Tataka. And uh, there's a story in many translations and many recensions about the background of that. Anyway, how do you spoil a sacrifice where pure offerings are being put in? Well, you shower all kinds of evil things, all kinds of horrible things, blood, flesh, um, many things like this, bones, just throw them. Now the sages have the power with a mere look to reduce these evils to ashes. And we have to take this story at many different levels. When we have a good intention, that is when we want to do some charitable action, not just for the sake of doing it, or that it's our duty, but out of genuine concern, or the welfare of all beings, the highest form of action that we can do. There may be some selfish things in the way. We may inadvertently spoil the whole thing by introducing all the negative thoughts that can come in. Doubt, fear, temptation, anger, greed, pride, jealousy, all you know all of these things. And if we're not careful to catch it, we have to be strong enough to hit them with military force, as if they were enemies. Well, of course they are enemies, but as if they were military enemies. We have to take a kind of military stance toward them, exert our own strength. Now, Vishwamitra, of course, and the other sages, they could exert physical strength, but then that would be against their vow, that they would be non-violent. Used to be violent, used to be a military person, now non-violent, now dedicated only to the good. Naturally, I have to engage people who are capable of doing these things, military people who are doing these things. And there are many, many benefits to what he's about to ask. So this noble sacrifice is being interrupted. What to do? It needs to be completed, but this de defiling is happening. These Marichi, Maricha and Subahu are defiling it. They're showering unclean blood and flesh on the sacred fire. And like other rishis, we could curse and destroy them naturally. But apart from anything else, it would waste all the energy of our tapasya. Any time that we have to deal with these issues that come up in our own mind, is an expenditure of energy, no doubt, until we come to a condition of habituation where we no longer have to attend to these things because the unconscious mind is nicely reformed. The habit, move, habit level will automatically move in a correcting way. Our troubles, says Vishwamitra, will end, actually, if we apply a certain solution. You can send me Rama. Now, Ram is 16 years of age, and that, as Vishwamitra has entered, Dasarata is contemplating with all the others about the future welfare of Rama in terms of becoming married and uh, the propagation of the species also from there, continuing the line and so on and so forth. All of that is a great, great concern. And so, at that critical moment, Rama, at such a tender age of 16, he's asked to come on loan, as it were, to Vishwamitra to sort the problem out. 
Rama is the eldest son. Naturally, he asks about him. And, but he says, no, he'll be okay under my care because the other level is I'll teach him all the things I know. I'll teach him about divine weapons. I'll teach him, I'll improve his concept of what is real dharma, what is an act of conscience. Other people may hesitate, but in his role as a royal person, as a military man also, he's entitled to exert his power in order to preserve harmony. So I might put him under a difficult situation where he may have to make an awkward choice. So he'll come under my uh, care and he'll grow in princely stature. He will surely defeat these Rakshasas, these demons, and his name will gather luster. Same thing with us. When we assert Rama's name, when we assert a mantra, when we assert our alignment to the divine, then also uh, we overcome these deleterious negative elements that we call rakshasas. So he says, please, entrust Rama to my care only for a few days. And don't refuse my request already, you agree to my request anyway. But he was anticipating the reluctance of Dasarata. At a tender age of 16, how can I, the son I love so dearly, how can I detach from that and send him off? In such a dangerous situation, you know, a whole line might be ended, he might be killed or something. So, entrust Rama to my care, don't refuse my request. He says, fulfill the promise that you gave me unsought. Of Rama's safety, you don't have to have any anxiety. You'll earn undying fame in the three worlds. He says, this would be meritorious for you. And Vishishta also, and all your ministers will actually agree with what you say. But Dasarata's reaction is that he trembles with fear. In other words, he's so attached to Rama, of course, naturally, a father to his such a beautiful, noble son. And he's afraid for his life, doubting. Fear and doubt assail all of us. How to neutralize that? We have to detach from a situation. Detachment, vairagya, is part and parcel of the effects of practice. What is practice? Practice is continuous sorting out, continuous assertion of the positive against the negative. Continuous alignment and assertion of what is true, away from what is false. Creating an antidote for an unconscious tendency to doubt and to fear and to be tempted. So he has a hard choice to make, either to give his well-beloved son to, be, to potentially be killed by the Rakshasas, that's what he's fearing, lack of faith, or to incur for himself the terrible anger that can be unleashed, as we know, by Vishwamitra, even though we know it's not real anger. Real anger would bring him down. But he's poss it's possible for him to feign anger. And in this, in the name of justice and righteousness and truth, with one word, one look, you can bring a person down. And so just for a few moments, Dasarata stands. He doesn't say anything. He's speechless. He was stunned and he was also bewildered. Anyway, he recovers from his shock. And he begs the sage not to press his demand. He says, Rama isn't yet fully 16 years of age. How can he fight with these Rakshasas, these demons? Of what use is it to send him with you? Why doesn't he know of the wiles of the Rakshasas? You see, Dasaratha can send his whole army if he chooses. But Vishwamitra has requested Rama. Then he goes on with so many arguments. We can also argue in our own minds, some false excuses for not pursuing the truth based on a lack of faith, a lack of trust, based on a, an element of fear. It's not right that I should send a mere lad to fight them. This is 
court case. I am here and my army is ready to march. How can a lad protect you and your Yaga Yudna? Tell me all about your enemies. I shall go myself. I shall go with you at the head of my army and do your bidding and serve your need. So just tell me about these desecrations that are occurring. Give me some information and I'll do it. Then Vishwamitra describes Maricha and Subahu and Ravana also. Don't forget the story begins as a parallel story in heaven with this demon Ravana, full of anger, pride and lust. And Maricha and Subahu are all subjects of Ravana. Ravana is their master. And he demanded again that Rama should be sent along with him. No, I want Rama. Dasalata persists in his refusal. And now he's really playing on the verge of danger. Parting from Rama will be death to me. Now he tells the real reason. I am so much attached to Rama. It'll be like a death to me. Please don't ask me to do this. I shall go with you and I'll take my whole army. It seems to me that the task that is proposed is pretty hard, even for me and my army. Um, so how can my son cope with it single-handed? How do you expect that? Indeed, I, I cannot send him. This is his final thing. If you please, I'm ready with my army. He's seeing the general picture. He's not seeing why Vishwamitra is asking specifically for Rama. Vishwamitra is a Brahma Rishi, a man of supreme wisdom. There's a reason why he's asking for Rama. Anyway, Dasarata's attempt to go back on his hasty word, go against truth, now enrages Vishwamitra, unleashes in him this feigned anger. And the king's pleas and reasons were like oil poured actually on to a fire of his anger. And you can see he's bringing tension to the whole scene. The whole court is now trembling. So Vishwamitra now in a measured way in the beginning, but with the hint of this anger, this conduct, he says, is unworthy of your whole lineage, going back to Ikshwaka, the whole solar dynasty. Tell me if this is your final word. I shall go back the way I came, and long may you live with your kith and kin, having swerved from the path of truth. It sounds reasonable, but there's an underlying note of danger. And the earth quaked and the gods were afraid of the possible consequences of the sage's wrath. Now Vishishta, of course, who is the family guru, now intervenes as he should. And he turns to the king and speaks gently, brings the whole tone down, tries to declutch the whole tense situation. It ill becomes you, king, to refuse, having promised once you need to adhere to truth. You've said it, you have to stick to it. What is truth? Your thoughts, your words, and your actions all have to align. Is there such a thing as a white lie? No. Truth is absolutely true. When you've given your word, you have to stick to it. You can't go back on it. You can't say as many do in some societies, or oh, I'll see you soon with intention, I never want to see you again in my whole life. And so Vashishta now turns to the king and he speaks gently. It ill becomes you king to refuse having promised. And born in this distinguished line, this Ikshwaku line, you cannot do it. Having once said well, you'll do it, you have no option, you have to do it. Failing to do this, failing to keep your word, you'll lose all the merit of your great gifts and deeds. In other words, you'll disappoint all the line of your distinguished ancestors. 
all the merit of your own karma, all of this is going to be destroyed. And if you destroy that, you're also destroying your whole kingdom. The whole of society will now disband. Send Rama. Send Rama with the sage. Send also his brother Lakshmana. The two of them go off. And you need have no fear of their safety because they're under the protection of Vishwamitra. Do you doubt Vaishwamitra's word on his protection? No Rakshasa, no evil can hurt them. Same thing when we take our protection under the name of God or Guru or Saint, then nothing to fear. We have that protection. And as the drink of the gods is shielded by the wheel of fire, wheel of fire so will Rama be by Vishwamitra. You have no idea of Vishwamitra's power. You've just praised Vishwamitra. You've told him about his, all his struggles, how he's now a Brahma, Rishi, and so on and so forth. But that's all froth. You have no idea. Now, Vishishta has a great idea because of his experience with Vishwamitra, don't forget, from last week we elucidated the story quite, in quite a good amount of detail. So you have no idea of what you're, what you're doing here. Um, he is tapas in human form. Bravest of the brave and wisest of the wise. He is master of every weapon. In the three worlds there's not, and there will never be any equal to him in martial or spiritual powers. What are the three worlds summarized as, you know, Bhubhuha Swaha, we have it in the Gayatri Mantra there. That is this world, that is the whole observable universe as far as the eye can see. And that of the world beyond and the interspace between. And all the seven worlds are there, seven lokas are there. It's an extensive area, most of which we have no idea about. So, bravest of the brave and wisest of the wise, is master of every weapon in all of these worlds. And when he was king, he obtained from the gods, from the deities, from the force of nature, mastery of all weapons. He beholds the past, the present, and the future. Then why does he want the princes, you may wonder. He can well take care of himself, of his yajna. Yag there must be some other reason, some other layer some divine motive goes in there. It's obviously for the good of your own sons that he's asking them, that he's come here and appears to seek your help. So don't hesitate, it's for their own good. Send your sons with him. And of course, listening to the wise Vashishta, as he always does, Dasarata sees things in a different way. He sings in, sees things more clearly. When we step back and proverbial count to 10 in a difficult situation, when things calm down, emotions come down, and we can see things in a more structured way, in a calmer way, then wisdom and reason prevails and we can make a good decision. So this is what happens. And very often it takes a good friend or a counselor or a teacher to point it out. So he makes it up his mind and decides, okay, I'll send Rama and Lakshmana. And so the two princes were then brought to the presence of the sage and the king and Lord, the queen mothers, all three of them, and Vashishta himself, they blessed them and send them off with Vishwamitra and off they go. And we are told that a pleasant breeze wafted and flowers were strewn by the denizens of the heavens because they understand the auspiciousness of this and auspicious sounds were heard. And so bow in hand, weapons in hand, the two lads, the two youngsters, the two 16 year olds strode proudly on either side of the sage. Valmiki and Kamban revel in this picture of the two hand, uh, the two very handsome princes marching out to their first adventure under the guardianship of a great Rishi who had also been a renowned warrior and teacher 
who could create a new world if he wanted. And beside him, head erect, two princely pupils, born to the end, the Rakshasa race. The start of a movement that is really the rest of the story of Rama. With swords of victory, with military weapons hanging from their waists, bows and quivers mounted on strong shoulders, they moved each like a three-headed cobra with uplifted hood, is the description. Now, when you see how these weapons can be employed, you're inclined, inclined to think, maybe these weren't mere bows, maybe they weren't just arrows, maybe the equivalent of modern day nuclear missiles. And each person will judge for themselves the truth of this, the curiosity possibly of this. But then we come to a different chapter now. What happens from there on? So we know that Vishwamitra and the two princes spent the night on the bank of the river Sarayu. And before retiring for the night, Vishwamitra initiates, gives some initiation to the two princes in the secret and sacred mantras, Bala, Atibala, which had the virtue of guarding them from fatigue and harm. It is mantras that are protecting thoughts. We all have mantras available to us, the most potent of which have been given by a teacher for real protection. Not only protection, but they bring in also. They don't not only block harm, but they also internally work promoting the ideal of purity and goodness. And so they slept on the verdant bank that night and rising at dawn proceeded on their journey. And then they reach Kamashram in Angadesha after presenting the princes to all the rishis around. Vishwamitra now recounts to them the history of the ashram. This is how it began. Gives them a background, gives them information. And this, he said, is the place where the Lord Shiva was long engaged in austerities, such a sacred place. It was here that the foolish god of love, Manmata, aimed his arrow at Shiva and was turned to ashes by his wrath. Hence, this place is known as Kama Ashrama. Now, those of you who know the story of how Shiva was tempted by the Lord of Desire, the spring, how Parvati was entreating him to wake up and how he uh, managed to open Shiva's eyes and how he was shot, as it were, with the arrow of Cupid. And Shiva, understanding this, burns this deva to ashes with his eye of intuition. Anyway, there were the guests of the rishis that night and the following morning after performing the usual morning rites and rituals and sandhya. The sage and his pupils set out on their journey and they reached the sacred river, the Ganga. They cross the river, they cross it on a raft, they get ready uh, for, they got ready uh, for them by the rishis. They were made ready and prepared. And in midstream, halfway across or so, the princes hear, hear a noise. And they ask Vishwamitra, what could this noise be? He explains to them that it was the sound of the Saraya flowing into the Ganga. We can even sit for a while and imagine the beauty of this scenery. And the princes paid silent homage to the confluence of the two holy rivers. You see, these rivers and this water, not just water, something that is flowing. Life is water. You can't survive physically without water. The planet is a blue planet, saturated with water. The oceans are there. And so can we not see the most hidden source of the whole world, of the whole of life, when we see these rivers? We shouldn't take them for granted. When I go down to any body of water, irresistibly, I may have to put my feet in and I have to pick up some water, say a prayer to all the rivers and so on, and put it over the head. Even if you're sitting by the beach, 
and there's the ocean coming in. You should say, you see, this is sacred because not only is it playing a drama of evaporating the moisture forming clouds and rainfall and so on and so forth, but it's also these sacred rivers are flowing into there. It's equivalent to all of these sacred rivers. It represents divine grace that flows in us, through us, with us, beyond us. And uh, anyway, the confluence of these two holy rivers, what a beautiful sight. A river or a hill, a tree or a cloud, indeed any object of beauty may raise one to contemplation of the Supreme Being and silent worship of Him. And in particular, sacred rivers, temples or images, which have for generations been the objects of devotion and worship, possess these power, this power in a special degree. In virtue of the sacred thoughts, they have witnessed and absorbed as garments retain perfumes. And in our own ashram here, around the corner, we're in the vicinity of a holy well called Lady's Well, was stemming back from ancient times where Celtic tradition was carried over into Celtic Christianity. And it was seen that the trees have a spirit, divine spirit, and waters have a divine spirit in them, clouds, air, everything. The whole of nature is sacred and infused with divinity operating through it. Acknowledging that, our mind gets elevated. Simply putting it as uh, an insentient thing, like a rock having no meaning, bypassing it completely, relegating it to merely the land of materialism. We are lowering the mind. We're lowering our understanding. We're dulling our feelings, our inner instincts, our reverence. Our inner creativity is being stifled by introducing intellectual abstract ideas and dulling the real connect, connection between divine spirit in the whole of nature. And the whole of nature includes us, of course. We often speak of nature as if it was something separate from us. No, we ourselves, psychophysical self, is all part of this nature. And behind it, as is behind all nature and expressing itself from it, is that divine source. In humans, we call it Atman. So having crossed this Ganga River, what next? Vishwamitra and the princes, they made their difficult way through dense forest. You can imagine, even in Ireland, how dense the forest was in the ancient days, in the, when all the forests were cleared and bogs were made inadvertently and land was made agriculture. Man's diet changed, man's physical digestive system changed also, but all the forests were cleared. And during the history, of course, forests get cleared more to make way for mineral exploitations and so on. Mineral exploitations or wood from trees that are designed to sustain fires in order to smelt copper and such metals. Anyway, we uh, can see how this dense forest was not only difficult to get through, but it was also made dreadful by the reverberating roar of wild beasts which were there in the forest. And this Vishwamitra said is the Dandaka forest. What is now a terrible forest was once actually a well peopled country. And once upon a time, the story behind this forest goes like this. Once upon a time, Indra, the chief of all the cosmic forces called deities, was contaminated by sin, having killed Ritra. The traditional stories about Indra will always have this antagonistic warfare between Indra and Ritra, representing good and evil, two antagonistic forces. The whole of nature is something like that. Now there's an interesting book which is called Vedic Science, written by a physicist. He goes back to the Vedas and he sees in there not just stories or myths or incomprehensible writings. He sees in them that these, this uh, karma kanda portion, as it's called, you know, all these, some, uh, these samhita portions, these mantras and praises of the deities and so on, not only contain praise of natural forces, 
but also contain physics and cosmology. And he puts Indra actually as uh, electrical energy fighting gravitational energy, Vritra. Because the whole of the universe is a constant antagonistic warfare, if you like, we can put it in those terms, but actually it's more a, a cohesive cooperation. But we can see that wherever something wants to expand and fly off, gravity will have its say and pull it in. And these tug of war, as it were, between these two forces makes a stable universe in the steady state models of cosmology. Today, we don't have steady state models. Today, we have the Big Bang model, or what is called the, you know, the, anyway, it's a, it's a, a model that says that there was an origin in the beginning. This is not the Vedic version, however. The Vedic version of the cosmos is, it's a rotating universe that looks as if it's expanding on one side and looks as if it's shrinking on the other side. An elliptical circular movement. Naturally, if you have this, then this angular momentum will be there and looks as if it is fighting with gravity. gravity gravitational energy operating at 500 pounds per, uh, per cubic meter and uh, the other also operating at five, 500 pounds. And 500 pounds, atom bombs per pound, I should say, actually, 500 atom bombs in one di direction, 500 in the other direction, all keeping things nicely coordinated and balanced. So this book would tell us that Indra is one such force and Vritra is another such force. Anyway, this uh, story goes like this, in this traditional battle between Indra and Vritra. Um, the Indra was, was contaminated in such a battle by some sin. Having killed Vritra and had, he had uh, therefore to exile himself from the world of the Devas, the world of all the other forces, because nothing really operates without this Indra. The Devas set to themselves the task of cleansing Indra. And so they brought waters from the sacred rivers and bathed him to the accomplishment of mantras, mantras purifying thoughts, and the waters which cleansed Indra flowed into the ground and enriched the earth, and the land became tremendously fertile. And that's the background to this place. All dead things rotting corpse, all dead things rotting corpse or stinking garbage when returned to the earth. They're all transformed into things of beauty, such as fruits and flowers. That's the nature of things and wholesome things that nourish life. And such is the alchemy of our mother earth. Now Vishwamitra continues, for long people lived here happily until Tataka, wife of Sunda and Yaksha, and her son Maricha wrought havoc and changed this into the dreadful wilderness that it is now. They are still in this forest, and no one dares enter into it for fear of Tartika. She is equal in strength to a score of elephants. I have brought you here to rid the forest of this great enemy. There is no doubt that this monster, who is the source of trouble to the rishis, will be destroyed by you. Now, Rama is listening very carefully to this, and he asks the sage, Vishwamitra, or he asks the sage, you say this is a yaksha. I have never heard that yakshas are particularly strong. What is more, how does a woman happen to possess so much strength? Now, the background to his inquiry is not just an inquiry. If he is now to destroy these forces, the moral conscience tells, how can I destroy or injure a woman? Anyway, Vishwamitra replies, you are asking a very pertinent question. Her strength comes from the boon granted by Brahma because all boons are granted by Brahma, who is the cosmic mind. And there lived a yaksha by name Sukitu, 
And having no children of his own, no family, no progeny, he performs tapas, discipline. And won a boon from Brahmadas. You realize that everything that you want requires self-control and discipline. If you want to run a marathon, you have to train. It requires discipline. If you want to climb Mount Everest, it requires discipline. If you want to do well in your studies, it requires discipline. If you want to do something well in your career, it requires discipline. Everything requires discipline. So he wins a broom from a gift from Brahmadas. You will have a beautiful daughter of great strength of body, but you will have no son. So Ketu's daughter, Tataka, beautiful and strong, was married to Sunda, a Yaksha, and their child is called Maricha. And you recognize Maricha is one of those who is desecrating these uh, ritualistic fire sacrifices, this Yadnya. Sunda at one time incurred sage Augustus' curse and died. And provoked by this, Tataka and Maricha pounced on Gustya, who cursed them to be monsters living on the carcasses of men. And so Tataka is now actually an ugly monster. Whenever we engage in this, we become ugly. We may be beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, maybe not so much. And so thenceforward, she and Manicha have been harassing the dwellers in the region of Augustia. Don't hesitate to destroy her on the ground that it's against Kshatriya's dharma to kill or sense of justice, to kill a woman. Women generally require protection. Man is physically stronger, supposed to be. Her atrocities are intolerable, though. And so to punish the wicked, whether male or female, it's the duty of kings, of royalty, of the administrative saint. It is right to kill her, as to kill a wild animal for the sake of human safety. This is a duty cast on rulers. And many women have been punished with death for their crimes. Hence, don't hesitate. Lesson, first lesson for Rama. The lesson is in, 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 in what is called Uttaman. That is justified, it's a justifiable action. You can see all along, there are many opportunities for us to evaluate, is this the right thing to do, is this the wrong th thing to do? I like Swami Vivekananda's definition of moral action. What constitutes the ideal of morality? That action, you can say thought and action that gives the greatest strength all around, all inclusively, to everyone. And if you take subject morality and apply that, then you'll be very wise indeed. You won't have any moral dilemmas. Anyway, Rama says to Vish, uh, Vishwamitra, our father's behest is that we should obey you without question. So bidden by you and for the general welfare, uh, we shall kill Tataka. Now, so saying, he strung his bow and twanged it till the forest echoed to its shrill note and the wild animals scattered in all directions in terror and it reached Tartika in her fastness, filling her with amazement at the audacious intruder. <laughs> she owns the forest. And this intruder who dares to enter her domain, who is it? And raging with anger, the characteristic of all demons, she ran in the direction where the sound was coming from. And she springs on Rama and a battle begins. The prince had first thought of cutting off the limbs of the monster and sparing her life. And in some versions, he cuts off her ears and nose. This was a common thing for your enemy. You cut a person's ears off, they can't hear anything. You cut a person's nose off, they're disfigured for the whole of public to know, ah, this person was punished. But anyway, Tataka attacks very fiercely and rising in the sky, she throws stones on Rama and Lakshmana. We can say probably boulders. And the two princes defend themselves against the attack. And the fight continues. And Vishwamitra cautions Rama against delay in dealing the death blow 
to the monster. Why would he delay? Because he's still weighing up. Should I kill a, fem a female? She deserves no sympathy, he says. The sun is about to set and remember that at night, Rakshasas grow stronger. Don't delay to slay her because the Rakshasas' natural environment is darkness. And so advice like this, instructed by his guru Vishwamitra, he decides on killing Kartika and pierces her chest with a deadly arrow. And the huge and ugly monster fell down lifeless. And of course, all the devas, all the illuminating factors in the universe, they all cheer. And Vishwamitra, filled with joy, embraces Rama and blesses him. And with Tartika's end, the forest was freed from the curse and became beautiful to see. And the princes spent the night there, and next morning they proceed to Vishwamitra's ashram. Now don't forget, there are still outstanding monsters, Tartika's spring, that are still threatening the yajna, the original task that they set out to do. And so at dawn the next day, Vishwamitra calls Rama to his side, blesses him and says, I'm very happy indeed. What is it that I can do in return for all that you have done? Anyway, I shall teach you the use of all the ashtras, all the sophisticated and hugely powerful military weapons backed by mantras. And so saying this, Vishwamitra gives Ramachandra the divine ashtras, weapons, the knowledge of them, the control of them, which he had obtained through, he himself had attained through his own tapas. And Vishwamitra taught Rama the use, control and recall also of the various divine weapons, complete control, and Rama in his turn, he imparted the knowledge to his brother Lakshmana. And there they continue their journey. Rama points to a big hill with a lovely forest on its slopes and asks, is that the place where we have to go? And who are the evil ones who hinder your yaga? And what should I do to destroy them? I'm asking. And Ramachandra now is eager to use the weapons to fight and win the blessings of the sage. And at that, we we'll pick the story up next Saturday. And this uh, remarkable story of not only the training and uh, acculturation of Rama and Lakshmana in the forest, but also gives us a clue of the potency of mantras and military weapons, but above all, the potency of spiritual life and spiritual discipline tapas earned by Vishwamitra and others. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Jai Jai Sri Ramachandra Ki Jai. Thank you. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you, Swami Thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you, Swami Ji. Merci beaucoup, Swami. Thank you, Shanti.